Hey guys, Kurt and Matt here. With Marvel Now, there's so many new and exciting series that for new and prospective readers, it's difficult to know what to read. So we're going to take a step back and do a series of videos giving you the gist of each comic book series, our personal opinions, and what's a good jumping on point for you guys. We're going to sift through the dirt so you don't have to. In this video, we're going to be looking at the espionage and kill squad themed titles of Marvel. A new Secret Avengers team forms as a part of a new S.H.I.E.L.D. director proposed by acting director Maria Hill. The team, led by Nick Fury Jr. and Agent Phil Coulson, includes heroes such as Hawkeye, Black Widow, Mockingbird, and the Hulk. With the use of memory implants, each operative remembers only as much as S.H.I.E.L.D. wants. With the rising threat of an organized AIM nation, the spy game is in full swing with assassination attempts, behind the scene deals, internal politics, and sleeper agents. Secret Avengers is very much a spy series. Spencer hasn't overloaded the team with superpowered heroes as it focuses mainly on the regular humans like Hawkeye and Black Widow. Perhaps what I enjoy the most about this series is seeing more of the inner workings of S.H.I.E.L.D. This series provides a great change of pace that you don't see in many Marvel comics. Plus, having Nick Fury Jr. as team leader is pretty awesome. I actually am not a fan of Nick Fury Jr. I feel his creation and subsequent rise to relevance is just so forced that I'd rather just see Nick Fury Sr. Regardless, this series feels smart and is full of twists and turns. Nick Spencer has added multiple layers of intrigue and it's clear that within this organization you never know who to trust. However, be warned, since the majority of each issue focuses on S.H.I.E.L.D. politics and briefings, there is a lot of talking heads and often very little action. Even I find it a little bit dry at times. For now, I'm on the fence as well. The brand new incarnation of the Thunderbolts takes the team in a different direction. In the past, convicted criminals made up the team, but Daniel Way has decided to fill the roster with the anti-heroes of the Marvel Universe. General Thaddeus Ross, the Red Hulk, recruits the Punisher, Elektra, Venom, and Deadpool to form a covert kill squad. The team's goal is to recover unauthorized gamma bombs before they release chaos around the world. The Thunderbolts lineup itself is reason enough to be interested in this series. And with all the powder keg personalities on board, it not only makes sense that the team has so many trust issues, but it makes for an enticing read. The characters have evolved to be more than just killers. My only grievance though is that the storyline can be a bit too predictable at times. Nonetheless, I think it's a solid book, not earth shatteringly great, but pretty good. I'm also a little bit torn with the Thunderbolts. I definitely enjoy a lot of this series. Watching the team overthrow a government on the island of Katajaya made for an interesting and entertaining first arc. But there are some glaring plot points which derail the series. I think that the love triangle between the Punisher, Elektra, and Deadpool just sucks the life out of the otherwise good book. For that, I'm on the fence. The Deadpool series offers what you'd expect, non-stop ridiculousness. Whether he's fighting undead presidents, hunting demons, or just eating ice cream, Deadpool's constant running monologue filled with pop culture references and witty insults adds another layer to the already preposterous story. Deadpool is accompanied on his adventures by an eclectic collection of sidekicks. There's Mike the failed necromancer, Preston the sassy shield agent, and oddly the ghost of Benjamin Franklin. As always, Deadpool is a light and goofy character for the most part. He will do the ridiculous things that other heroes don't do, like battle dead presidents. While the series can be entertaining and funny, I never walk away from an issue being blown away by the story. There are no thought-provoking endings or universe-changing moments. For that reason, I don't have a strong feeling either way with this series. I thoroughly enjoy this series. It obviously isn't here to make you think, it's trying to make you laugh. And there's consistently at least one or two lines per issue that has me laughing out loud. I like how this series is also taking a deeper look into Deadpool's psyche, or at least as much as there is to look at. Even with the ridiculousness around him, Deadpool just wants a friend. And the scenes inside Deadpool's head are a real treat. Overall, I recommend this series. Uncanny X-Force looks at the secret kill team of Wolverine's X-Men. Past iterations of the team have been led by the likes of Cable and Wolverine. However, this team features a heavily female roster composed of Psylocke, Storm, Spiral, Cluster, and Puck. The series attempts to continue the storylines put forth by Rick Remender's run, like Phantom X, while also bringing back classic characters like Bishop. This is an in-your-face series that features fast-paced action, aggressive dialogue, and rampant violence. After the last Uncanny X-Force series, this one feels like a little bit of a letdown. 
The stakes clearly are not at the same level. Instead, this series chooses to focus on Psylocke's psyche and how she's piecing her life back together. I feel that the only storylines worth mentioning from this series are the ones that were created in the previous volume. The three Phantom X's, now called Phantom X, Cluster, and Weapon 13, and their relationship with Betsy are personally the only draw for me. For anyone heavily invested in the previous volume, I think it's worth checking out this series to find out what happens, but for everyone else, I'd skip it. I agree that this series is somewhat disappointing with the reboot. What upsets me the most is how they almost immediately changed the outcome of Rick Remender's incredible Uncanny X-Force run. The personal progress made by Betsy has been completely undone. It initially seemed like the series relied on cheap tricks like having three Phantom Xs and bringing back Bishop to sell issues. But as the story has progressed, Uncanny X-Force has really started to grow on me. I think once readers can get over the initial shock, they will begin to truly enjoy this series. In Cable and the X-Force, Cable handpicks Domino, Dr. Nemesis, Colossus, Forge, and Boom Boom to save the world before anyone else even realizes it needs saving. Cable is suffering from headaches that are causing his brain to hemorrhage. Though he's slowly dying, these headaches are giving him visions of the future, and bad things are coming and only he knows how to avert them. The problem is, when Cable embraces the mentality of doing anything to save the world, his group is branded as another mutant terrorist organization. Now, the Uncanny Avengers, S.H.I.E.L.D., S.W.O.R.D., basically everyone with an agenda is hot on the tails of these mutant fugitives while all they try to do is help. Dennis Hopeless is very ambitious with this series. I enjoy the fact that he tries to be more than a typical X-Book. Cable and his team aren't necessarily motivated by their connection to the X-Men or mutants in general. Rather, they're simply trying to do the right thing. The series features a rich cast of characters. I like how each member of Cable's team is somewhat broken, but still wants to be a force of good in the world. Throw in the fact that this is the only Marvel Now series to focus on Hope, the hero of AVX, and I think this is a series worth reading. I'm actually a bit disappointed by this series. When I first heard that this series would be following fugitives, I was hoping that Cable would be leading a team that walks in the gray area between doing right and wrong, allowing questions about ethics to become an intriguing central focus. Instead, I feel the team is more misunderstood than anything else. They are very clearly doing the right thing, just going against the authority to do it. The facets I do enjoy about the series are the team's relationships, like Cable's treatment of his daughter, Hope, and Klaus's growing relationship with Domino. Regardless, overall, I'm not too impressed and I'd skip it. Winter Soldier originally spun out of the events of Fear Itself. The series focused on Bucky Barnes dealing with the demons of his past, while the majority of the world thinks him dead. There's a lot of loose ends from Bucky's time as a Soviet agent, and with the help of his love interest, Black Widow, he tries to tie up as many as he can. The series has a very noir feel, and it airs on the side of realism with spy games and actual consequences instead of big name superheroes and easy fixes. Brubacker, having been the one to bring Bucky back from the dead, knows how to write the character well, but surprisingly I felt that the replacement writer, Jason Latour, did not do a disservice to the character. This series is filled with a lot of inner conflict, and even though I have never been a fan of Bucky, I personally enjoyed this series, especially Brubacker's run, and I think it's worth checking out. I think the main problem with this series is that it doesn't really fit in with the larger Marvel Universe. Outside of Black Widow, Bucky is largely alone in his quest. Ed Brubacker made the series somewhat bearable, but when he left, the quality severely declined. While the series does a good job of delving into the past of the Winter Soldier, I lost interest in Bucky when he stopped being Captain America. <laughs> We also want to hear from you guys. Do you guys disagree with our assessments? Leave your thoughts below in the comments. Make sure to check out our other Marvel Now Guide videos as well. Thanks.